Hi there. In this lecture, we see Bobby Fischer against Friedrich Olafsson. So this is Blood Tournament round four. E4 from Fischer, C5, Sicilian fence, knight f3, g6, an accelerated dragon, d4, c takes, knight takes d4, bishop g7. Fischer elects for knight c3. He can actually, given that black hasn't played knight f6, he can actually elect to play for a Maroxy bind, but that wasn't his preference here. This is an interesting, often played move against the accelerated dragon, given that black hasn't committed white to block in the c pawn. However, this is really interesting what happens. Knight c6, bishop e3, knight f6, and now bishop c4, queen a5. And now white castles kingside in this particular situation. We see d6, knight b3, queen c7, bishop drops back, black castles, f4, a5, which does concede a weakness of the b5 square. Fisher marks that square. We have knight b4. And now rook f2. This is a very interesting maneuver to get the rook to d2 later and still have the flexibility of sometimes f5 if needed as well, depending on what black does. We see e5 immediately, which does weaken the d5 square, but it creates other possibilities for black. If bishop d7, perhaps sensible for white is just to play h3 as an example, and bishop f3. This modest approach with the rook coming to d2 shows that white's design here is against the d5 square. Everything is looking at d5, the knight, the rook and queen. This looks like a pleasant position for white to start with. Anything more exotic like g4, you know, e5 for example, f takes, d takes, this is pretty committal. Well, it might might have a small edge here though as well, but it looks a little bit weakening, uh, a little bit in this situation inappropriate maybe. So rook f2, we have e5, and now we have the move bishop f3 in this situation. So clamping down more on d5, bishop d7, rook d2, clamping again more on d5. So it's an overprotection of the d5 square, basically. Nimzovic talked about overprotection, especially of key central squares. It means that the pieces are naturally coordinated against that key central square. Often it's e5 as well, as an example. Here we see king h1. You might wonder, why can't this pawn be taken on d6? Black has a great resource here on rook takes d6. And these technicalities are one assumes seen by both players to some extent, all the variations. If rook takes d6, it seems the best move for black is bishop takes a4. So exposing more pressure on d6. And it sort of backfires on white. If rook takes, rook takes hitting the queen, it backfires on white. And then black has options like taking here and knight d3. That would seem to be the most punishing. Anything else? If you're wondering, by the way, about knight takes c2, just bishop b6 puts an end to the dream here. White's crushing it here on bishop b6. So that's, that seems to be the key point. If you take on d6, there's bishop takes a4. So king h1. Fisher is not that greedy. He, he knows the traps. Bishop c6. When he takes pawns, it's for good reason and usually without being trapped. Okay, so except in one of the World Championship games where he did trap his bishop, taking a, a naughty pawn. But that's another story for another day. We see here queen g1 looking at bishop b6, so immediate threat of bishop b6. Knight d7 holding that b6 square. And now actually f5. It's afforded by this position because of white's control on the d5 square. We see b6, and white builds up naturally rook a d1. It seems harmonious enough, White's position. So knight c5 is played. Now here, it seems as though this is a slight inaccuracy. It looks interesting, knight b5, offering double pawns in a dynamic manner, which would also, by the way, you know, be able to kick out the knight maybe with c3 later. It does seem to have a lot of perks. It seems here queen f2 is a very strong move. 
as well though. For example, rook a c8 actually runs into a tactic of f6 and taking bishop g4, hitting f6 and c8. That's a naughty tactic and trap. So what does black do after queen f2? If rook a b8, let's try another move. Well, I can actually take on c5 and knight d5 and get a very, very strong light square domination here, it seems. For example, like this, where then squishing on the king side becomes possible. This seems a great way of playing it, in theory, as well. So queen f2 can set off a light square strategy generally, it seems. So knight b5 was played. We have queen e7. Uh, there are interesting variations here if uh, taking, it looks as though, well, what about this horrendous looking treble pawn situation? This situation is actually kind of good for white. Look at the b6 issue. If queen b7, bishop takes b6, and rook takes d6, you might wonder, hold on, king's crusher, why not just protect that? What about these treble pawns here? Actually, the knight, if you look at the knight, the dynamics here, look at the dynamics, not the statics. The knight actually can't get back here on any key square. It's kind of stranded. And actually, white could play g4. And actually, h4, just go go for it on the king side. There's a bind here. It seems a free hand on the king side. And even if b5 is lost, white can break through, it seems, on the king side in this scenario. Very instructive scenario, in my view where the rook can actually help the queen on the h-file. If white gets time for this attack, it's a very dangerous attack. For example, like this. This is just a fictional example. White gets a brilliant attack out of it. So it all merges from... Look at these double, treble pawns again. <laughs> these treble pawns here give white a bind. If black has to waste time winning b5, white can whip up a great attack. Interesting stuff. So we see queen e7, though, not tempted by structural uh, damage just queen e7 but here fisher judges this pawn is safe enough to take we have knight takes c2 trying to distract like this with uh, the knight being undermined but fisher plays knight takes c5 but it's actually though let's look at the intricacies here if rook takes c2 in fact best is bishop takes a4 it seems with a nasty skewer against the knight and the two rooks and if fg hg white's best is knight takes f7 it gets all a bit hair raising really rook d2 supported by the knight it's all hair raising tactically and it ends up in theory being an equal position there so yeah, uh, very, very interesting. Okay, let's go back. But uh, knight takes c5, Fisher rejects all of that, just knight takes c5. And we have knight takes e3, queen takes, b takes. And now the light square tra uh, strategy is ignited again. Bishop e2 trying to maybe get pressure on the diagonal and an outpost on d5 potentially. Bishop takes a4, b3, bishop e8. So white sacked a pawn here, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But has good light square play. After a4, bishop d5, looking at the rook. Rook takes d6, offering an exchange here. You might wonder why. If rook a b8... Then white plays knight takes, f takes, and is in a very dominating position. That is a marvellous position with the bishop on d5. So black actually wanted to sack the exchange instead of that scenario. We have uh, the rook getting entrenched. So it does seem as though black's onto something, a good point. fg, hg, b takes, bishop takes a4. And interestingly, this next move, rook a1, seems extremely logical, but it might actually be a mistake. It seems the best here is uh, rook b1. And for example, if c4, bishop d5, 
bishop d7, queen c3. This situation wants doing well with that outpost. After rook a1, black missed a brilliant opportunity here and indulges in, you know, trying to win material with an ex trying to win on this uh, skewer diagonal with bishop h6 by playing queen f8. So queen f8 was played, but it turns out here in this situation then actually black had queen d8 and whatever way it's cut it seems as though black's doing quite well here in theory so it's looking at rook takes these so it's pretty forcing if bishop d5 bishop c6 is the magic an absolutely magical move which solves all of black's problems to at least be equal if, you know that outpost is undermined or winning the exchange here and then in fact black can just remove that and this situation is enough compensation it's about equal if we go back again if rook takes d4 by the way and this this situation is also kind of pleasant for black is actually winning for black with the, with the past pawns and the bishop this is just crashing through the past pawns are crashing through so queen d8 was an interesting shot tactically very very interesting profound tactic yeah but we have queen f8 more crudely based around bishop h6 skewering queen and rook but fisher just plays bishop d5 a brilliant idea now is unveiled based on common squares like a8 so Fisher positively invites Bishop H6. Anything else is in White's favour at this point anyway. If King H7, then check. Rook takes D4, Rook takes A4. If Bishop D7, then just double, and then we're using A8. And this is nasty, for example, like this. is better for White. Winning a Bishop there in broad daylight. So bishop h6 is played. Pardon me, bishop h6. So what do you think Fisher's idea is here? It's really super tactical and brilliant. It's an absolute brilliant move. If I give you five seconds to pause the video, what do you think White plays? Okay, rook takes d4, and now bishop takes e3 is played. If e takes d4, white gets time for queen g3, exploiting the pinned pawn. So bishop e8, queen takes g6, check. Bishop takes f7. And this is mating, crashing through. So the queen sack is uh, accepted. But now rook d takes a4, and rook a8 is threatened. The queen gets out of the way, but rook f1 is really strong. Black's king is unsafe. We have bishop f4 threatening mate. But a really cute move is played here, which opens the floodgates to Black's king. Can you see what that is? Here, if I give you five seconds to pause the video, what would you play here with white? Okay. G3, yeah, trying to get the bishop out of the way. We have queen h3. If bishop takes g3 is played, then check, and then check. Easily winning. So queen h3, but now... This rook just goes back, just waiting for that bishop to get out of the way. After rook a8 check, here the game ended. The two rooks are coming in with checks. You know, checks are in the post. King g7, rook takes f7 check. Rook h8 check would win the queen. Well, <laughs> instructive takeaway points. For me personally, looking at this game, I like the way that it's about d5 control to start off. We we, we can see an overprotection strategy of d5 emerging with the bishop f3 with the rook coming to d2. Everything's around coordinated around the central point. With great caution though, you know, not to take pawns like d6 prematurely. With great caution. And here looking at b6, putting some pieces, defending the queen side. This f5, yeah, and 
here, yeah, we see that potentially white could cash out this whole position into a light square strategy on Queen F2 behind the scenes. We saw a cashing out, which is very instructive. That's the most precise, it seems, from our technology that we can see from this position, it seems, at least I can see from this position, that actually white can actually translate this whole position into a light square domination like this. But the way it was played was very, very interesting um, with knight b5. Black avoiding doing structural damage, realizing that the knight might be stranded perhaps. And then we have some simplification, Fisher avoiding most of the uh, strange complications there, getting a more simplified position where, again, it's more about the light squares. He sacked a pawn positionally for this situation. He's a pawn down here, but his light square control is good. And in fact, black decides the second exchange here, not liking outcomes otherwise if an exchange that isn't played. And uh, yeah, it looks for a moment that entrenched rook is something major. But then Fisher comes up with this amazing queen sack idea. It's incredible, this game. Incredible, a masterpiece. Fisher's been playing some masterpieces in, in Blood 1961. He seems to have made a great evolutionary leap in this tournament from previous play. A huge evolutionary leap. Yeah, okay, I'll take you to that uh, game end position. Actually, we're, we're close. I'll just. The game end position was actually Rook 8 check. Marvelous. Positional play, tactical play, all coming together very precisely. Okay, thanks very much. Hi guys, if you enjoyed this video lecture, you might want to get more at my course, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher, which I had a blast creating over 25 hours of video content. I tried to get the most instructive juice out of every single game covered and picking the most important games from this period. I had an absolute blast creating it, and I think you will have an absolute blast checking it out. And it's at a big discount code with this link. You know, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher has the discount code. So I hope you do check that out. Thanks very much.